Okay. Hello. What we are going to do today is talk about Spinoza's ethics. Spinoza is an interesting character who is decisively a theist, but was so adamantly excommunicated from the Jewish community in which he was trying to be a theist that it just boggles the mind. Um, it, he never really quite found an intellectual home, and his biography it has a whole series of very interesting, amusing stories of his little escapades and whatnot, uh, all of which are somewhat external from uh, what we're doing with Spinoza, which is, under the theme of the course, to ask in what sense for modern philosophy we can come to know ourselves. Now, um, in asking you to read uh, the, the 50 some odd pages of Spinoza that I've asked you to read, I've asked you to do something very difficult. It's very, very difficult material owing largely to his style and his deployment of geometry as a philosophical method. Right? So he's doing a geometry of ethics, which is it's, it's strange and it works out in sort of an interesting kind of way. So um, I've asked you to do something really, really hard. Right. Of course, it, I know from my experience, uh, the first really, really hard philosophy that was plunked down in front of me, huh, really, it allowed me to rise to the challenge. And um, yes, I really enjoyed being challenged. So by asking you to read this, what I'm doing is I'm saying that I think you're able to if you apply yourself. Right? So hopefully you find this quite rewarding. Um, the first task, and it's, I've got to say, this is one of my first read-throughs with Spinoza too, so um, I've asked myself at the same time as I'm asking you to do something hard. I've asked myself to do something fairly hard too. Um, I've been meaning to read Spinoza for quite some time now, and uh, I've spent a, you know, a lot of time over the past little while trying to wrap my head around the rather complicated argument that Spinoza is pl plunking in front of us. And it, the first part of this, which actually took much more time than I was expecting, uh, is, well, it's something I find reading any new philosopher to me. And it's, I find I have to spend a lot of time figuring out how to read the philosopher in the first place. Now, interestingly, um, <laughs> I came across, and, and, and when I, I have difficulty understanding something, I, I usually go, like any good researcher, to a simpler sort of account of the material to help guide me through my primary readings. So what I did is I went online and I ordered a publication, Spinoza, in 90 minutes. Uh, and I will say I spent more than 90 minutes having read this four or five times. But um, it's interestingly early on in the life and work section in this publication, uh, which is really great in some ways and really poorly written in others, um, it's, it, there was an account of Spinoza's style. Um, he sets it up this way. The other book Spinoza wrote at this time was a short treatise on God, man, and his well-being. Written in Dutch, it contains many of the ideas which were soon to appear in his mature philosophy. Unfortunately, when Spinoza came to write this philosophy, he decided against writing it in easily readable Dutch. Instead, chose Latin, contorting uh, this into the geometric style to which uh, he had reduced Descartes' work. He took a later, longer work of Descartes and reduced it to this style that I've got you reading here. Um, uh, this style rendered his masterpiece, The Ethics, virtually unreadable. The entire uh, work is broken up like a piece of Euclidean geometry into a series of def definitions, axioms, propositions, and proofs. And he gives you, um, the author here gives you an example um, of this, and I've, I think quite a humorous one, so we'll start off just by reading it. Definition and you'll recognize this style. All right. Definition. A book is defined as something you can read. Two. Style is defined as the way in which the author chooses to write a book. Axioms. We read a book because we are interested in finding out what the author has to say. Two. 
the style of a book plays a major role in its readability. Proposition. This style is unreadable. Proof. It's likely that most of you have already given up reading this proof. See Axiom 1. If you have read this far, it's certain that you will not read much further if I continue to use this style. See Axiom 2. Therefore, this style is unreadable. QED. Quid ex et demonstrate. Right. So, that's what we're dealing with, and to a certain extent, what we're going to have to do is repast this uh, geometric style that, 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 that Spinoza is using here, because his position, I find it, frankly, just fascinating. To a certain extent, um, it's, I should note, too, that the, the, the chunk of the ethics that I've given you is just a small chunk of the ethics. Spinoza goes on for over 200 pages in precisely this kind of style. Once you get used to reading it, I find them funny. Right? I found myself sitting in a cafe reading the ethics, laughing out loud at some of the demonstrations that he would he'd, he'd offer. Right? It's, it's, there's sort of a wry sarcasm to the way that he lays out his de definitions, propositions, um, and, and, and axioms and proofs that 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 it just it tickles me. It's funny, right? Um, if you ignore the style in which it's written altogether, so um, it, so 200 page over 200 page of, uh, of this and uh, rather than trying to be difficult uh, the reason why he's picked up this style is that he's trying to be clear rigid and systematic so that the ideas presented can be evaluated on the basis of their truth rather than the rhetorical flair in which they're presented. Um, it, there was a playwright by the name of Bertolt Brecht who did something similar to this, Mother Courage, Three Penny Opera, that sort of thing. When the plays were presented, what the, the actors uh, were instructed to do is issue it as deadpan and as seriously as possible because most people in terms of uh, observing political plays, what they would do is react emotively rather than react rationally, which then Brecht would assume would actually bring about action. Right? Spinoza's up to something similar here. It's so rigid, so formal in order to have you be persuaded by the truth and the necessity of, 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 of the inferences rather than uh, the rhetorical flair in which the work was presented. And that, that far, I think, it was a success because I don't think anybody's you know, really persuaded by Spinoza's rhetorical flair. Um, so, all right, even so, um, it's hard to read and really it, I have to congratulate you for um, getting through it making an assumption that you got through it. Now, um, it's, as I was laying out here, um, just, just in that sort of humorous account of the unreadability of his style, it operates from definitions. And he starts off in part one by laying out his eight important definitions. I'll highlight four of them that are important, though I will read through all eight of them. This is in that first section, um, section one of the ethics, uh, which he's trying to lay out the nature of God. And I hope you'll see that really what Spinoza is doing is he is taking Abelard's and then Descartes' use of the ontological proof for God, God's existence and doing ontology with it in such a way as he is pushing that proof to its strongest, most necessary consequences. And the results are sort of interesting here. All right. So he starts off with eight definitions. By that which is self-caused, I mean that whose existence involves, or is at, excuse me, by that which is self-called, I mean uh, uh, self-caused, I mean that whose essence involves existence, or uh, that whose nature can be conceived only as existing. Well, you remember that from the ontological proof. God is a perfect being. Even those who want to deny that God exists 
have to accept that definition of God. They deny that a perfect being exists. Perfection entails existence. And the, 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 the sort of explication of that is a perfect being can lack nothing. Abelard's formulation was a being than which nothing greater can be conceived. If you conceive of a perfect being that doesn't exist, you can still conceive of a more perfect perfect being who does exist. Right. So what you are referring to as a perfect being, its essence entails its existence because existence is a perfection. So the first definition is basically a formulation of the ontological argument. Right. So a self cause right, is a being whose essence involves its existence or whose nature can be conceived only as existing. So he's right off the bat referring to God. Right? Two, a thing is said to be finite in its own kind when it can be limited by another thing of the same nature. Right? So finite is a being that can be limited uh, by something of the same nature. Definition three, and this has to be the most important definition that Spinoza offers here. By substance, I mean that which in itself, <clears throat> which is in itself and conceived through itself, that is, the conception of which does not require the conception of another thing from which it has to be formed. So substance right, is something that is conceived only through itself, right? It doesn't require anything further in order to, 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 to bring about the conception. Act, uh, definition four, also very important. By attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives of substance as constituting its essence, right? So substance is something that is conceived in and of itself and an attribute is that which the intellect per uh, that that by which the intellect perceives uh, the essence of substance. By mode, uh, definition five, I mean the affectations of substance. That is that by which something else. Uh, 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 excuse me. That which is in something else and is conceived through something else. Right. So, um, you would conceive of a horse with hooves. Those, those hooves are involved in the horse. Uh, awkward, but it, you get the idea, right? And then, definition six, also very important. By God, I mean an absolutely infinite being. That is, substance consisting of infinite attributes, each of which express eternal and infinite essence, right? So by absolutely infinite, right, what Spinoza is doing is heading off the common misconception of that ontological argument, right? It's lots of people think that you can use the ontological argument to prove the existence of a perfect rice pudding or a perfect turtle or something along those lines, but Right? By calling God absolutely infinite, not just infinite of its kind, what he's doing is saying that the perfection of God and only God entails existence. Right? Um, or at least he's in dialogue with that particular notion. Then the last two. That thing is said to be free, which exists solely from the necessity of its own nature. And this is important to, with regard to your discussion question and is determined to action by itself alone. A thing is, is said to be necessary or rather constrained if it is determined by another thing to exist and act in a definite and determinate way. Right. So free is wholly determined by its own nature and constrained is determined by the nature of something else. Right. So if we think already about the way these definitions are being laid out, right, what what Spinoza, what Spinoza has done is broken down 
the distinction between divine substance and uh, temporal substance. Right? It's the stuff that we're made of. So essentially, God as a perfect being exists as nature. Right? So it, it can be said, and this, 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 this definition 7 already lays this out, and this is something I actually like about the way Spinoza is laying out this argument. It's all contained within these eight definitions. Right? Um, it, 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 what he's already claiming is that um, a thing can be said to be free, which exists solely from the necessity of its own nature. God, as a perfect being, is an absolutely necessary being, and he's already defined God um, as um, an absolutely infinite being and a self-cause as um, uh, something whose essence involves its existence. Right? So the only being to which the word free can be attributed is God, but that freedom acts in terms of its necessity, because all substance is already contained within this notion of God. God is the only substance. Right? So God's freedom stems from its essence, which acts with necessity. So nature is laid out in a necessary way. So interestingly, we're all completely causally determined. So God does not actually act from a free will. God's freedom is an expression of the necessity of God's essence. All right, so it's what you've gotten from the additional supplementary um, material that I posted on Moodle for you is already a notion of a god who is, to some extent, and this was, you know, hit very, very heavily in the CBC's Ideas uh, podcast that I linked you to, uh, who is more or less existing completely as what it is, which actually agrees with the idea I am who am, or the Yahweh idea, right? So more or less, right, what we find is that God just simply is. So God preferring us, or being persuaded by our love for God, Spinoza considers that absolutely ludicrous. The power of prayer does not make any sense to God. Mer er, to Spinoza, miracles do not make any sense to Spinoza, because all of these things—God answering your prayers, God uh, producing a miracle, or something along those lines—would be essentially God in disagreement with itself, right? Or God changing its own nature, right? Which is absolutely infinite, perfect, and completely what it is, right? So we're only at definition number seven. He's got one more. By eternity, I mean existence itself insofar as it is conceived as necessary uh, following solely from the definition of an eternal thing, right? So what we find here is a notion of God which is completely imminent, and I'll explain that in two ways. One, God is completely in substance, completely in nature. Right? So, in a sense, we are all, as is this chair, this dry erase board, this piece of paper, this computer I'm recording this on, these are all aspects of God conceived as the infinite possibilities that make up the whole of nature, including its determinate laws, etc. Right? So it's all very necessary. Right? And uh, I had a second way. It, I just blanked on it. Anyhow, it's it's in my notes. We'll come to it. Right? So what a few of the features that Spinoza is laying out here in its metaphysics, um, the, the, the first has to do with substance monism. 
Right. In Descartes, he identified several different substances, and I, I mean the idea that 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 um, is being laid out by Spinoza here is one in which um, the completely in, infinite, uh, imminent um, uh, second thing. It's it's it generally we think of God as a creator of the universe. Here's the universe. God stands apart from it and creates it. Right, um, but. By Spinoza's argument, as distinct from just about every other Western philosopher, he's presenting us with the notion of a god who is completely the universe, who is completely nature, right? It's not as though god is other than the universe, god is the universe and is existing as um, what somebody like St. Thomas Aquinas through Aristotle would consider pure act with no potency, right? Now, interestingly, it's this notion of potency that explains for people like Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas the notion of the free will, right? I have this potential to act this way, that way, or the other way. I choose freely between those in an act, right? So the freedom that's ascribed to God right, by Spinoza is completely other than that. He is pure act. More accurately, it is pure act, right? This God is that it is, and it is currently ising, right? At all moments, stemming from our own limited modal finite perception. Right. Of course, by Spinoza's argument, things like time and duration and extent, these things do not apply to God. Right. It's so completely other that it's, it's our finite perception that allows for, and we'll see this come out as an important aspect of Kantian philosophy as well, it's our perception right, that brings about these notions of space and time and duration and extension, etc., etc., etc. Our perceptions act causally as determined by the laws of the universe which stem from God's essence, yes. Right. But to some extent, they're per perspectival right? and mutate our understanding. We'll get to that. So substance monism. Right? So like I say, uh, most Western theorists think of God as a divine substance as it, distinct from temporal substance, from uh, the, the stuff that we perceive. Right? Well, it, the substance monism that comes from um, from Spinoza is rather simple to argue, right? Um, and this is the means by which um, Spinoza argues that God is not ontologically distinct from uh, the universe. It goes like this. Um, premise one, God exists. Premise two, since God possesses every attribute, and um, it, we, 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 um, we already um, said that in definition six, by God I mean absolutely infinite being, that is, substance consisting of infinite attributes, each of which expresses eternal and infinite essence. Right. So since God possesses every attribute, if any substance other than God were to exist, it would possess an ab attribute in common with God. But since there cannot be two or more substances with a common attribute, that's in the axioms, there can be no substance other than God. Conclusion, God is the one and only substance. So God is not ontologically distinct from God. The universe. I find that fascinating. I find that to be just a fascinating argument, right? But stemming from this is a very hard causal determinism, which we'll get to, right? Now, this this argument, this substance monism, provides the basis for um, what we'll call um, the modal system, God or nature. Right. So um, what you found in your reading is a distinction that Spinoza is making between uh, natura naturns or nature naturing, that is God, right, as pure act, right, um, with no potency to use the, the, the sort of medieval scholastic terms, um, and uh, natura, nat natura, 
right? Or nature natured, right? Which is the system of modes, right? So um, <clears throat> what we have is uh, an ontological unity between God and his system of modes and a causal relationship between God and this modal system, right? Um, so God is an imminent rather than transcendent cause, which I've just explained a moment ago, right? So um, it, largely, it's this dis dis distinction exists as a conceptual distinction for uh, Spinoza because um, nature naturing and the system of modes in which we understand nature go back to the definition for mode. By mode, I mean the affectations of substance that is that which is in something else and conceived through something else, right? So we are, to some extent or another, modes, right? Um, it, it, what, what Spinoza maintains is a distinction between two types of mode, infinite and eternal versus finite and temporal, right? So um, to a certain extent, right, we all exist as human, qua human kind of thing, but Grant grants in a particular mode, and you mode in a particular different mode, right? So these are, um, as he as he defines uh, mode, uh, the affect, uh, affectation of a substance, right? So, right, Grant can be understood through human as you can be understood through human too, right? We are differing, as he would point out, finite and temporal modes, right? Um, which are distinct from eternal and um, infinite. Now, this notion of substance mona, monism, um, as to some extent I've already pointed out, already prevents the kind of dualism that Descartes affirmed, right? Um, so, with regard to it, if you remember in Descartes, um, there was a hard distinction between mind and body, and we can know for Descartes our minds very well, and much better than we can know our bodies, right? Um, Descartes argued that they were closely united, but never really con it, it, it consistently or adequately argued that. Um, but nonetheless, they are distinct and even to some extent opposed to one another. Right? But the substance monism, as argued by uh, Spinoza, right, prevents that kind of distinction because God is nature, nature is God. What um, is included within God is all of substance. So the kind of distinction that Descartes was making between mind and body cannot stand. Right? Um, it, what, what Spinoza argues, rather than this dualism, is a, a tightly sort of dependent sort of relationship between mind and body, the mind existing as the idea of the body, right? Now, interestingly, um, uh, let me see if I can't find my note on that. Darn, I cannot find my note on that. I'm going to pause in order to find my note on that.